All right, this is Lauren Potter again. Thank you all for joining this afternoon. Um, I represent the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program. For our webinar today on improving recycling quality colleges and universities, we have three speakers. So first, I'll be talking a little bit about the Recycling Works program in general and what we provide for colleges and universities. And then I'll turn it over to John Fisher, the Branch Chief Commercial Waste Reduction and Waste Planning from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection to talk about the issue of contamination in recycling and what the MassDEP is doing to address the challenge. And finally, we're happy to have Abby Webb, Sustainability Manager from Casella, a recycling business that operates two material recovery facilities, or MRFs, in the state of Massachusetts. And she'll speak about the challenge of recycling contamination from their perspective and describe what colleges and universities can do to make sure they're collecting clean recyclables and also collecting the appropriate materials based on what recycling facilities can currently handle. So, Recycling Works in Massachusetts is a recycling assistance program that provides free assistance to businesses and institutions such as colleges and universities. And the program is designed to help maximize recycling, reuse, and food waste diversion opportunities. Recycling Works is funded by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, though all of our services are provided at no cost. And this slide shows our homepage, which includes the Find a Recycler tool, and there's a URL to our homepage below. So Recycling Works is designed to help businesses and institutions comply with mass DEP waste bans and also maximize overall waste diversion. We know that when an institution implements a comprehensive waste diversion program, it often saves some money and typically improves employee and customer satisfaction. For colleges and universities, Waste reduction diversion is especially important because it often supports the broader sustainability goals that the institution is striving to reach. So the Recycling Works program has a really robust website, the number of different resources, and many of these are particularly relevant for the colleges and universities sector. So we have a web page dedicated to this sector that provides video case studies, featuring different schools such as UMass Amherst and Massachusetts College of Art and Design, which is shown on the right. As I mentioned, the Find a Recycler tool on our homepage allows you to locate haulers and processors of recyclable materials and also organics. And we have a number of best management practices developed in partnership with key stakeholders on topics such as hauler contracting, food donation, and soon to come we'll have one on office and institutional furniture reuse, which is an important topic for colleges and universities. So Recycling Works is available to help colleges and universities with whatever waste diversion needs they have, and not just limited to traditional recycling. So this can include starting a new program to collect food scraps, figuring out what to do with certain surplus materials, or just improving general recycling in public spaces. We always offer assistance over the phone and by email, and we can also come on site to meet with you, conduct a walkthrough, and develop specific recommendations for your college or university. Our technical assistance usually includes things like training staff on best practices, help connecting with waste haulers and processors, and providing customized signage, which we have been updating to ensure that our signage is up to date with what the material recycling facilities can currently handle, noting that this may be different than what your signage currently shows and what you're currently collecting. We also host an annual forum for the college and university sector during the spring semester, which focuses on a variety of relevant topics. These are great events for networking with others in the field and especially relevant for facility managers, recycling coordinators, dining service operators, and other sustainability professionals. We will make sure that everyone on this webinar gets an invitation for this year's College and University Forum, and please contact us if there are any specific topics that you'd like to learn about this year. Again, the Recycling Works hotline is staffed every weekday, and we're available to answer your questions by phone or email. 
and help determine whether it makes sense to send someone to your school to provide one-on-one -on -one free assistance. So I'm going to turn it over to John Fisher from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection next. Please remember as you're listening today that you can always type in your questions into the chat box and we'll be fielding questions after John and Abby have both presented. All right, John, we're going to switch the presenter and the screen over to you and let you take it away. John, I think you might be muted yourself. Sorry, uh, is the uh, screen go. up now? The screen is up and we can hear you. Super, okay. So uh, I, I just want to give a little um, overall context about what we've been doing at the state level here in Massachusetts, how that relates to what's going on nationally and internationally. And then Abby will speak to the perspective of a recycling company working through these markets and and what's happening with Casella and uh, their facilities and their programs. So many of you have probably heard by now that a lot of what's been going on in recycling markets has been driven by changes in China in terms of the quality of recyclables that they accept and uh, therefore the uh, limited quantities that they're accepting. And because Chinese markets are such an important part of national and international recycling markets for the for the US and Europe and really worldwide that has had a big effect on the recycling markets here in Massachusetts. And um although Chinese markets are uh requiring improved material quality, really that trend is happening across the entire recycling system. Recyclables are moving. There are recycling markets and materials are going to market, but they're more difficult to move, they're more challenging to move, and, and across the board for most materials, prices for recyclables that are being collected are down. So material values have dropped quite a bit, which has, among other things, resulted in the cost of recycling increasing. Sorry, I didn't get my first slide there. So we know that, that over time, historically, and, and we're pretty confident this is going to continue, that recycling markets are always going to go up and down over time. That's nothing new that's happened before. Uh, it'll happen again. But you know, one thing I think is pretty clear is that the need for the improved quality of the materials we're collecting is here to stay. Uh, colleges and universities face really particular challenges with um, ensuring they have good quality recyclables. Uh, college and universities have a lot of uh, diverse facilities and recycling streams, a lot of public-facing programs, which are more challenging um, for keeping material clean. And so, you know, colleges and universities are right at the right at the heart of all this. Uh, and today, we'll, we'll really be talking about the curbside recycling mix, paper, cardboard, bottles and cans, materials that are going to our MRF facilities. But I think it's important as we talk about these themes and ideas today, it's important to keep in mind that this is uh, a key focus no matter what you're doing, whether you're uh, separating and collecting recycling or food material or trash, it's important to really make sure all these materials are being kept clean and separate to the maximum extent you can. So what MassDEP has been doing, we've been working on several fronts to try to improve this, to try to make our recycling systems work more efficiently and effectively. Uh, one thing that we've done is worked with our recycling facilities, uh, including Casella, to develop a, a universal recycling list. This will be being rolled out shortly. Uh, the idea is that this will establish a clear set of materials that all of our recycling facilities have indicated that they are willing and able to accept. It will also make it very clear the materials they most definitely do not want. Uh, and that includes things like plastic bags, food waste, tanglers such as hangers and wire and cord and hoses and trash. Uh, so we want to be very clear about the basic materials that we do want to collect in our recycling programs and then very clear on the materials we most definitely do not want go going in any recycling container anywhere. Um, and then there will be more detailed uh, guidance on more specific materials. Um, as part of the rollout of this program. Uh, MassDEP has hired a marketing vendor to help us roll out this program statewide. And while it will have a residential recycling focus, 
I think a lot of the messages and the materials and information will be uh, able to be translated to businesses and institutions for their programs, and we'll be working through Recycling Works to do that as these materials get rolled out. We do actually have a webinar today right after this one, so if you're interested in uh, staying on a webinar and going right from one to another, you're welcome to do that. However, if you're not and that doesn't work, don't worry about it. We'll be uh, we'll be sharing out more information as we go, and there'll be a bunch of uh, announcements coming out over the coming weeks about the resources and guidance and information that uh, that we'll be sharing. So stay tuned for that. And as long as you're in touch with Recycling Works, then all of this information will be channeled out through them. Another thing that we're focused on here in Massachusetts and for MassDEP is to do what we can to foster recycling markets. That's frankly not going to work for everything. Some markets we just really uh, do not have a lot of in influence over as an individual state. But in certain cases, we do have an ability to influence local markets and to help strengthen the market for targeted materials and to keep those materials managed here in Massachusetts. So we have a couple programs that help us do that. One is our Recycling Loan Fund. Uh, we can provide loans for really any recyclable commodity or compostable. Those loans can support collection, processing, remanufacturing, a really diverse set of activities. And we can issue loans up to 500000 These are either for businesses or nonprofit entities to help them grow their infrastructure for managing uh, materials right here in Massachusetts. Uh, and this can include uh, capacity investments at MRFs. Uh, we also have a Recycling Business Development Grant Program that is limited to certain specified materials, whereas the loan fund can be used for really any recyclable or compostable material. We have these target materials specified year by year for our recycling business development grants. Uh, we do have a grant uh, application round open right now, which runs through October 5th. Those grants range anywhere from $50,000 to $400,000 and can be used for recycling infrastructure and capital investments to uh, increase the recycling of any of these materials in Massachusetts. So we do have a couple market development programs going on that we think can help uh, support recycling markets for some particular materials. Um, some uh, key ones that uh, that we think we can make a difference on are these target materials listed here. Uh, that will potentially change year by year, but these are the ones we're focused on uh, for the current cycle. And I would echo what uh, what Lauren said in her introduction to take advantage of the Recycling Works program resources. This is a uh, an unusual program. Not many states offer programs like this, and uh, if they do, it's often not to this degree. Uh, it's a great resource to take advantage of. Uh, in particular, we encourage you to work with your haulers and your recycling outlets on communication and feedback. Recycling Works can can help give you advice on that if you like. Um, but in this age where we're really focused on reducing contamination and improving quality, it's important to have that good communication and to have that quick feedback so that problems get resolved as soon as possible. And you know, no matter what you're doing, keep all these streams separate. Keep your recycling stream uh, as clean as possible, but also you know, keep recycling and food waste out of the trash. There are good, valuable materials we still want to divert. Um, and these market conditions don't change that. And of course, keep your trash out of your recycling and the food waste streams. If these material streams aren't clean, they become very difficult and expensive to handle. And this is really the single best thing all of us can do to help make these systems work. And if we can deliver clean materials to our recycling facilities, that's going to make this whole process work better for everyone. Um, so that's all I've got. I'm happy to uh, answer questions uh, after um, after Abby speaks about Casella's programs. Thank you. Thanks, John. That was a great overview of what the Mass DEP is doing in response to some of these market changes. And Abby, we will pass the presenter role over to you and let you introduce yourself and speak about this from Casella's perspective. Fantastic. Can I just confirm that you can see my, my screen there? And can hear you. Oh, sorry. Yes, I can see it and hear you just fine. Okay, perfect. 
Um, well, thank you. So I'm Abby Webb. I'm a sustainability director for Casella, and I just wanted to say thanks uh, to both Recycling Works and to MassDEP for setting this all up. Uh, this topic is so timely, and um, I really believe that it's essential to the future of uh, the future of recycling, ongoing sustainability of recycling. Um, so thank you for that. Um, for those who don't know Casella, I'll give the, the high level overview. Um, we are a full service solid waste resource management company. Our headquarters is in Rutland, Vermont. Uh, we have operations throughout the Northeast across six states. Um, and we actually service customers throughout the US. Oh, that's not good. Um, we do um, for you know, we do a lot of things for purposes of this call. Uh, we are a hauler, we do collection. Um, we also operate recycling facilities, and, and most importantly, we work directly with customers to help them receive their recycling goals. So we're really comfortable in this space. Um, I also always have to uh, do a little shout out. We actually recover over a million tons per year of uh, recyclables and uh, organics from the disposal stream each year. Um, really proud of that. So I think John already teed this up nicely. Um, I'll just kind of give you my, my spin on it. Um, We've seen a lot of big changes in the world of recycling um, over the past year or so. Um, the biggest change is coming out of China. Uh, they've enacted new policies focused on reducing contamination, and the effect of that has been to drastically restrict the amount of material that they're willing to import. Um, the changes went into effect uh, earlier this year, and they've shown that they're serious about these changes. So. Um, I think you know, as we're all having to respond quickly to, uh, to to those changes in the marketplace, and contamination is one of the issues that, that has really come to the forefront because of that. Um, another big change is that uh, the Northeast's largest glass processor uh, in Massachusetts closed its doors back in March. Um, you guys all know glass is heavy, um, so it can make up a big percentage of the recycling stream, and at this point, it essentially has no place to go. Uh, third change is that just in general, the recycling mix is shifting. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot less paper. Uh, that's thanks to email and online news. Um, we're seeing a lot more cardboard. We can thank Amazon for that. Um, and then we're seeing shifts within categories. For example, plastics um, are shifting from, you know, higher quality resins and, and predictable bottles and things like that to uh, mixed commodities, um, layers, flexible plastic, things like that. So, so we're just seeing a shift in what's in the recycling mix in general. And then most importantly for our discussion today, we are seeing contamination go up. Uh, this chart really, I think, brings home the point that, that this is having a profound impact. All of these things together are having a profound impact on recycling markets and the economics of the recycling system. So you can see here um, that you know a, a ton of recyclables today in 2018 is worth 12.6% of what it would have been worth in 2011. Um, you know, I, I think that number speaks for itself. Um, I'd also point out, you know, as John said, we're, we're used to ups and downs in the commodity markets. We've, we've lived with those for decades. Um, but if you look at the trend line on this chart, you can see that we're sort of, I think it's fair to say we're in unprecedented territory on all of this and, and that there's a fundamental change in the economics of recycling. So I'm guessing that most of us on this call probably don't have a, uh, a lot of pull with President Xi Jinping. Um, so there's not a whole lot we can do about the Chinese markets, but what we can do is tackle the issue of contamination. So that's what I'll really dive into now. Um, when I'm talking about contamination, I'm referring to the unacceptable items in the recycling the recycling stream, um, which have become a major problem. Um, coming into our facilities, we've seen uh, more than a 50% increase in the amount of uh, contamination coming in the doors over the past 10 years. Um, and that's just an average. So the, the, the increase in individual markets has been even greater. Um, and just to give you a sense, we're, that's, that's averaged across everything. If you look at individual loads coming into us, we've seen some with contamination rates uh, over 50%, 60%. You know, it's, some of these, these loads are, are basically garbage. Um, and I wish I could say otherwise, but I have to bear the bad news that a lot of the top offenders that we, we're seeing are, in fact, college campuses. 
So what's Casella doing about it? Uh, we are working to get the word out uh, in a number of ways. We've launched um, and are in the process of launching what we're calling our Recycle Better campaign. Uh, there's a lot of components to this. I'll just blow out, throw out a few. It's, it's really you know, evolving as we speak. Uh, but we're, we're leveraging social media, uh, print ads. We've established a web page. We're, we're creating some videos. Um, we've adopted the, the Massachusetts Universal List, and we're updating all of our signage to reflect that. And then we're doing a number of targeted pilots to really see what else we can do to go above and beyond this to really move the needle on contamination. Like I said, this is sort of uh, being produced as we talk. You know, I was in meetings this morning. I'll be in in more meetings this afternoon. This this is really something that that we're uh, we're putting all our resources against and and trying to figure out how we can move the needle on contamination. Really, though, that you know, the message that we want to convey is this: we need to go back to basics. We need to revisit what's acceptable in the recycling bins. Um, so, you know, I. I I'm guessing most of you are familiar with this, but I'll just walk through briefly. Uh, we're the acceptable list is corrugated cardboard, box board, different types of paper. We're, you know, office paper, newspaper, magazines, junk mail. That's all acceptable. On the plastics, it's it's the containers. It's it's plastic bottles and plastic tubs and lids, plastic jugs. Um, you'll note that we're not so much talking about the numbers one through seven or the you know the resin types anymore. Uh, we find that that messaging is just so confusing for the general uh, public, and, and they fall into that trap of thinking, oh, there's there's a triangle with the arrows on here. It must be recyclable. So, so we're trying to step away from that and just say, hey, you know, these it's it's the bottles, it's the tubs and lids, it's the, the jugs. Um, aluminum and steel, those are acceptable. Glass is acceptable. So that's what, what belongs in the bin. So then the other uh, side of the coin is, what's not acceptable. So, so we're really trying to help our customers with this. We've identified eight items that, that due to the volume or kind of the nature of, of how they behave in the MRF are really problematic for us. So, so those eight items are, are really a big target for us. But then over here on the right-hand side, you'll see I have a number of other unacceptable items. Just to walk through this quickly, um, you can see the plastic bags. So that's uh, the, oh, Plastic bags are the, the number one item that we're uh, that we're seeing, uh, at least in the curbside mix, in terms of contamination. Obviously, it doesn't weigh a lot, but in terms of individual items, plastic bags uh, are are pretty common and they're a big problem. So I'm going to show you some photographs shortly that that show why why plastic bags are a problem in the recycling facilities. Um, but the short answer is that they wrap around our equipment and and um, and basically eventually shut us down. So uh, other items on this list, the tanglers, um, so we're talking about hoses and rope, cords, uh, Christmas lights, things like that, that, that wrap around the equipment. Those are a problem. And then um, I'll jump around a little bit here. The clothing and textiles falls into that same bucket. Um, a pair of jeans can really wrap around our equipment and cause big problems. Uh, food waste is another big problem um, in that it uh, degrades other uh, otherwise recyclable items. Scrap metal can be very damaging to our equipment um, and, and should be recycled through scrap metal recycling programs. Uh, we also want to get the word out that batteries and electronic waste don't belong in the recycling bins. And um, you know it, that's a safety issue. They can cause fires. They can have um, different substances leaching out of them. Uh, they just don't belong in the in this, uh, recycling program. They, they belong in a dedicated electronics program. And then you'll notice I've been dancing around the bagged recyclables item here on the list. Uh, I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, it's uh, a big topic for colleges and universities. Um, but just to, you know, I, I won't read through this whole list over here on the right hand side, but, but just to pick out a few highlights, John mentioned the hangers are a problem. Um, any, any kind of coated paper, so this surprises some people, but um, hot cups like coffee cups or uh, soda cups. With, with a thick coating, uh, those are not acceptable in the uh, recycling stream. Um, anything with food residue, um, styrofoam, things like that, and then uh, ceramics and, and baking glass are also unacceptable. 
to just kind of, you know, I just want to step back. I think the easier messaging is to just, you know, rally around what is recyclable. Um, but if, if people do need the specific guidance on what's not to re not recyclable, we're providing that information too. This is, I, you know, I, I said I'd show you why the, the tanglers and the bags are a problem. Um, the photograph here on the left, for those who have not had the pleasure of visiting a recycling facility, um, these are rotating disc screens. So this is a big part of our sortation process. It's basically how these work, um, you know, you've got these rotating shafts with discs on them, and they're angled and spaced in such a way that allows cardboard and paper to float up over the top, and then everything else falls through um, to go on to the next step in the sortation process. Um, so very important part of our process, and unfortunately, in the photo on the right, you can see what happens when bags and textiles and cords and ribbons and um, VHS tape uh, go through the, uh, get end up on those screens. You know, they very quickly wrap around, um, around the screens and, and then they don't work properly anymore. Eventually we do have to shut the whole plant down and someone has to climb in there and cut all of that stuff out. Uh, so it, that's why we're, we're so adamant about um, working with our customers to get that stuff out of the mix. And just as a reminder, I think sometimes people forget that on the other side of their recycling bin, um, there are people that are involved in the sortation process. Um, our, in Massachusetts, we do have highly automated facilities, but there are still people involved. Um, so I would really encourage everyone to keep that in mind um, when the worst contamination that's going into the, the mix can put these employees' safety at risk, it can damage equipment, it can shut us down. And it can also degrade all the other otherwise recyclable items. Um, so for all these reasons, we really need to clean up the stream. Just want to throw a vocab word out there for, for you guys. Um, we talk a lot lately about this, uh, this idea of wish cycling. So wish cycling is the practice of putting non-recyclable items in recycling bins, hoping that they're going to get recycled. So I, I wanted to throw this in here just because I know, I, I think we all know that people aren't intentionally recycling wrong. Um, so I think it's a combination of they just genuinely don't know or un, unsure, and they kind of come from this wish cycling perspective of, you know, when in doubt, I'm going to put it in here because I hope that that means it'll get recycled. And I think, you know, just recognizing that can help us think about how we want to approach the, the public and, and start to tackle the issue of contamination. You know, people aren't in doing something wrong on purpose. They, they just don't realize that it's a problem. So I wanted to uh, touch on a few specific best practices that, that we have found effective on college and university campuses. I'll just, there are four of them and I'll just roll through them. Uh, the first is, uh, is, is training. So Four-year colleges, by definition, have about a 25% turnover uh, rate each year. Uh, I think we all know that that uh, the academic um, community can be especially prone to wish cycling. You know, they're progressive and they want to do the right thing. Uh, you also, on a campus, have uh, departments that maybe don't always communicate uh, super well uh, with each other. So all of these are some challenges that are somewhat unique to the college and university environment. So our recommendation here is that um, to tackle contamination, it, you know, you need to start fresh uh, and really retrain everybody. Uh, the best training is tailored to each department. So you'll have training that focuses on dining. You'll have training that focuses on athletics, facilities, custodial, student body. You know, I, I could go on, but, but tailoring your training um, really is, is a lot more effective. Uh, the message needs to be that there's no tolerance for contamination. So, so we, it's, it's really time to get the, make sure that trash is, is in the right bin and that the recycling bins contain only recycling. I think, you know, if there's the silver lining here or, or a positive message is that there are individuals on every campus who know exactly where contamination is coming from, and that's the custodial staff. So we've seen a lot of success with campuses who have been able to successfully engage their custodial staff to uh, identify and, and help to address the what I'm calling the hot spots of contamination on campus. And then the last thing I'll say on the topic of, of training is that uh, recycling training is never done. 
Uh, it's an ongoing thing. You have turnover, people forget, things shift. Uh, you, it just needs to be a part of your annual training calendar. The, the most successful programs have found a way to just, you know, hit this on a continuous basis year after year. Bin placement is another big challenge on college campuses. Um, I think most of you know that, that a campus can easily have thousands, literally thousands of trash and recycling bins uh, between indoor and outdoor spaces. Um, and lots of times just by nature of, you know, being added over time and, and um, different departments ordering from different places and things like that, you end up with this wide variety of shapes and sizes, colors, labeling, and so on. And then labels fall off and whose job is it to put them back up? You know, all of these things um, are, uh, can contribute to the challenge of contamination. Um, you know, I've, I've literally been in campus libraries where standing in one spot I could see dozens of recycling and trash bins. Um, so that's a lot of work for your custodial team, but it's also just almost begging for contamination um, because it's so hard to keep the signage up to date on all those bins and it's just so easy for people to talk the wrong thing in the wrong place um, without even thinking about it. So we recommend that, that each campus conduct a campus-wide inventory of all your bins and literally you know, create a map um, you know, map out with it, where they are, what type they are, and come up with a plan to improve it. Um, as far as improving your placement, um, I would say work with your custodial staff to always pair your trash and recycling bins so they're always next to each other. Uh, coordinate your colors and labels so it's consistent across campus. And then find places where you can eliminate those redundant bins. Again, like I said, I, I think that those, those extra bins lying around are just asking for, for contamination. We also see an opportunity for waste audits. So, um, you know, kind of along the mindset of, of you can't manage what you're not measuring. Um, the use of waste audits can be a really uh, nice activity to help you identify those hot spots um, on campus where the contamination is a problem, but then also track your progress as you as you do different education improvements and, and you know fix up the bins and fix up your signage. Um, you can use these audits to track your progress. Um, so we recommend uh, conducting multiple audits across campus throughout the year. Um, and then, uh, you know, to, to do that, recruiting and training multiple different groups to support those audits so, so you can have dining services involved. Uh, we've seen sustainability offices engaged. Student groups are often, um, you know, jazzed to, to get involved with this. And the nice thing about this is you get good data to help uh, track the progress of your program. But it's also an engagement activity. It's a it's a way to make the uh, the topic and issue visible to the broader uh, campus body. So I said I would come back to bags. Uh, this is the last thing I wanted to address here. Uh, we recognize that just about every college campus uh, uses plastic bags, and I'm, I'm referring to bin bin liners. Um, in one form or another to collect and consolidate and move recyclables across campus. Um, we understand that they're, they're important to day-to-day -day operations. At the same time, it's very true that, that these bags cause real operational problems at recycling facilities. I showed you how they tangle in our equipment, um, but they also, um, you know, another problem is that they prevent the detection of other contaminants in the recycling stream. Um, so they sort of have a, a double a double whammy in terms of their negative impact for us. I wish I had like a super easy fix for this one. I don't. Um, I understand they're important on campus. I also understand the challenge that they have at the recycling facilities. Um, so I think for now, I can just tell you what we're doing is is working. We're, we're obviously working to eliminate other forms of contamination. Um, we're encouraging the custodial staff to eliminate the practice of what I would call nesting the bags. So that's where, you know, custodian is going around, a, you know, a large room and they kind of put all the recycling bags inside of other recycling bags. Um, keeping them out so at least we're only dealing with one bag to get the recycling is a huge help. Um, wherever possible, we're trying to reduce or eliminate the, the use of bags, you know, in certain areas. Um, you know, again, like I said, there's no easy fix to just immediately eliminate the bags overnight. Um, but but there, those are a few things we can start working on um, 
together as, as we look for other solutions. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. I'll just quickly run through these. I, I think some other things you can do is take a look at your goals. Sometimes I worry that having really aggressive recycling goals, while I applaud the ambition, um, sometimes people can slip into the habit of, um, you know, uh, when in doubt, recycle it mentality because um, they want, they're, they're striving for quantitative uh, percentage target, uh, recycling rate target. Um, obviously putting non-recyclable items in the recycling stream doesn't help anyone from an environmental or sustainability perspective. So I encourage you to think about your goals and, and how they might be contributing um, inadvertently to contamination um, and think about ways you could reframe them. Um, engaging procurement is uh, a great solution. So if you're worried about like the hot cups, for example, but you know, this would be an obvious example. Uh, hot cups are not recyclable, but you could encourage the use on campus of, of reusable, uh, reusable mugs. And then last, I was just gonna say, we, we know that college, the influence of colleges and universities um, in the community is, is strong. Uh, you guys are leaders in the community. So another uh, opportunity is, is for, for you to wield that influence to uh, bring the message of how to recycle properly um, to the broader community um, and, and remind folks that, that these same guidelines apply at home too. Um, and with that, I think I will, I think that was my last slide and I'll be happy to answer questions. Great, thank you, Abby. That was excellent. I love all the specific recommendations for colleges and universities. Um, so I wanna remind everybody that you can type in any questions that you have for myself about the Recycling Works program, or for John about what the Mass DEP is doing to address market shifts, or for Abby um, for some of the best practices that she shared or recommendations. We don't have any questions yet as far as I can tell. I'll ask one question. Uh, Abby, I'm wondering, in your experience working with colleges and universities, is there typically one role, one person at, on campus that sort of becomes a champion for this, or does it really tend to be a um, collaborative effort across different departments? Oh, wow, yeah, I, I would say that every campus is unique. Um, some of them, you will have a, a specific champion who really emerges and carries things forward. Others, it will be a more collaborative effort. Um, yeah, I, I would say I've, every every college that I've ever worked with has been has had a unique set of players involved, and that's part of what our job is is, is to figure out who those folks are and, and help get them engaged. Great, thank you. So we have a couple of questions here on chat, and I think the first one is directed to Abby. And if can you expand on the difference between capturing rates versus diversion rates? Are those the same or different? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, did, I, I didn't really go into detail on that on my slide, but I did mention it. So um, I wanna make sure I do this justice. I usually draw this out on a piece of paper when someone asks me. <laughs> um, I'll just say, so diversion rate basically says, okay, how much of all of the solid waste I generate, how much am I um, how much am I recycling? You know, how much am I am I removing from the disposal stream? It's not a perfect definition, but for for contrast, the capture rate is is more about saying, okay, how much valuable stuff do I have in my my total solid waste mix, and what percentage of that valuable material am I capturing? Um, so it's just it's a different lens on it, um, and you know, I think it's something that is a more near term achievable goal. Um, so, you know, maybe pairing the two could be a great compromise for, for a, a college, you know, have a long-term uh, recycling and diversion goal, but a near-term capture rate goal. Great. Thanks, Abby. So, another question is, um, how can a college or university get a redeemable bottle collection at their school? I don't know which one of you want to address this. If you 
there a returnable bottle collection bin on campus? John, do you want to take that one? Well, John, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? So, I'm not sure about um, returnables per se. We we really don't have a re returnable bottle infrastructure at all. But as far as redemption, um, so there's a couple of different ways a college could go. Um, they could try to partner with a nearby uh, redemption center, if there is one in their community, and try to work out an arrangement with their redemption center. Um, they could also seek to uh, to try to get a uh, reverse uh, vending machine installed. There are companies like Tamra and Invipco that uh, manage reverse vending machines that um, might uh, might be a way to work that make that work. We've had some some places I think try to do that. Um, and another way, which I'm not sure you would want to do, but is something is a possibility, is for uh, someone to actually, you know, register to be a redemption center and, you know, take back uh, redemption containers from from people in the college community. So there's a couple different ways um, that you can go along those lines. I think maybe the most uh, promising and uh, straightforward to implement would be trying to work with an existing nearby redemption center. Great. Thanks, John. So next question, I think, is also for John Fisher. Um, are RBDG or RBD grants only available for recycling companies, or are colleges eligible for those grants? So they're intended for those grants are intended for companies that are uh, collecting uh, recyclables from multiple sources. So generally speaking a college most likely would not be eligible unless they were actually operating a recycling facility that was collecting material from multiple sources, which is, is probably unlikely. Generally, they're intended for facilities like uh, like MRFs, uh, like companies that are setting up a glass recycling operation, a mattress recycler, a uh, construction and demolition recycling facility. Places like that would Really, it's the entities that would most likely be receiving the recyclables from a college or university are the ones who would typically and most likely be uh, eligible for and receiving those grants. Great. Thank you, John. So the next question that we have um, is whether there are any exemptions from recycling certain material streams, for example, plastics, if or when the cost becomes excessive or exceeds what the university has budgeted? I think that's for me as well. So yep. <laughs> we have waste disposal ban regulations in Massachusetts that ban certain materials from disposal. And uh, that includes, you know, in this con it includes a number of materials, but in this context, basically cardboard, recyclable paper, bottles, and cans. Uh, so we do have the ability to issue um, what are called exceptions in the regulations, or we commonly refer to as waivers. However, those are generally not intended to be issued simply on the basis of cost, but rather that there's something about a normally recyclable waste band material that makes it uh, unrecyclable. Uh, one of um, you know, uh, one of the ones that we've we have done some waivers for, for example, is packaged food material. However, we have a growing infrastructure to manage packaged food material, so we do that less and less often. Uh, we have issued some waivers recently for single stream recyclables to uh, some recycling facilities and haulers, but those have been more because there have been limits on the infrastructure where there simply were not recycling facilities that could take the material because recyclables have been moving slower. Uh, we went through a period where at times all of our recycling facilities were essentially full and the only way that trucks could be emptied were if certain loads were sent to disposal facilities. So those are, it wasn't that the material was going to cost too much, it just wasn't uh, the the capacity just was not available, period. Um, so it's those types of cases where we've issued waivers. If you come to me and tell me that, you know, your hauler is going to charge you more for recycling than for trash, um, it, we're, we're not going to issue a waiver on that. 
uh, basis. The fact of the matter is, you know, in the long term, um, disposal is going to get more and more expensive. We really need to preserve our disposal infrastructure. And while recycling markets will go up and down, and they're down right now, in the long run, it's important to keep those materials flowing steadily to recycling facilities. So um, on a pure um, cost basis, no. Um, if it um, became somewhat, you know, of a ridiculous cost figure, then um, potentially yes, but then I'd also tell you to go check with other haulers and see if you can get a better price. Um, so generally speaking, we we won't give waivers for cost, and I think if you're uh, collecting the right materials and uh, you're delivering recyclables to uh, to recycling facilities, while sometimes it may cost more than trash, it should generally, um, in the big picture, be a, um, a cost-effective program. Great, thanks, John. And I also mentioned one of the best management practice documents that Recycling Works developed is about hauler contracting um, and sort of navigating that whole landscape. And so that's part of the technical assistance that we can provide as well as helping you ensure that you're finding a cost-effective way to stay in compliance with waste bans. So next question is, uh, under Recycling Works technical assistance, can Recycling Works help design an audit of campus recycling? Um, so I'll answer that. We don't conduct waste audits ourselves, but waste stream analysis is definitely a part of the Recycling Works technical assistance. Um, and so we can advise on where to start with a waste audit. Um, or what types of things to look for. But generally, we look a little more big picture by just you know visually inspecting bins, seeing what the hauling procedures are, the movement of materials around campus, and help identify pain points um, within that. And, and Lauren, I'll just jump in to say that, um, that that is a service that we regularly provide to our customers uh, at Casella. Um, we've also been hired um, by by folks that are not actually our customers to provide that as a professional service. So, so we do um, that kind of support with uh, waste and recycling audit programs. Great, thanks, Abby. That's excellent to know. Next question: Why is you why is using a waste to energy facility not considered a form of recycling? given that the waste material goes to generate electricity and minimizes product handling. John, do you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, that, that we have always considered that disposal under our regulations. Uh, it, um, Although it's being burned first, it's all ultimately disposed of. It's burning uh, mixed MSW, and it's just not recycling. Uh, we've never considered burning something to be recycling it. So... Um, if um, you know, if you choose to send your trash to a municipal waste combustor versus a landfill, that's you know, that's a separate question. But um, no, we don't consider taking paper and cardboard and bottles and cans and burning them to be recycling. Thanks, John. And a follow-up question was: I think they were predominantly asking about paper waste, but um, you address that in your response as well. I'm not seeing any other questions. Last chance, if you have any questions, get them into the chat box and we'll be happy to address them on the call here. Otherwise, if we don't have any additional questions, I just want to emphasize the recycling work service that exists is available to all of the colleges and universities in Massachusetts at no cost. Um, please call our hotline, send us an email, visit our website, and um, we would love to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. If you have any waste-related questions, technical assistance needs, um, we're happy to connect you with service providers like Casella, who provide additional services like waste audits. And with that, I think we'll wrap up for the day. We will also be following up with slides and a recording, and everyone who attended today will be uh, notified of the college and university forum this spring. 
and I look forward to working with you further. Thanks, John and Abby, for attending and giving us these valuable insights. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Have a great day.